This morning I wish to speak to you about the importance of following Christ. In the scriptures we read the following words. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always until the end of the world. These words come to us from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 28, verses 21 to 22. They were spoken by Jesus. Liturgically, they are read at every baptismal service. They also constitute a portion of that pericope that is known as the first Eothenon Gospel reading that is read on occasional Sundays during the liturgical year. Referred to as the Evangelistic Commission, the words of Jesus here speak to us about the importance of baptizing and teaching and making disciples of all people. And in addition, this particular passage of Scripture gives us the reassurance that God will be with us until the end of time. Today, liturgically, is the second Sunday of Matthew. It is also referred to as the first Sunday after Pentecost. The Gospel lesson of today that we just heard liturgically read comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 18 to 23. And this particular passage of Scripture narrates for us the story of four individuals Four individuals who left all in order to follow Jesus Christ because they recognized him as the Son of God. And following Jesus Christ after making the same type of recognition is why Jesus gives to us the evangelistic commission. The commission, of course, carries with us, with it, a promise of a reward. And the reward is that God is going to be with us. This is important because there is so many unbelievers in this world today, but the promise is that God is going to be with us until the end of time. Jesus, we are told, was walking along the Sea of Galilee. And there he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter and Andrew, his brother, and they were casting their nets into the, into the sea because they were fishermen. And Jesus said, come, follow me, and I will make you fisher of men. And then going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, and they were in the boat with their father, Zebedee, and they were mending their nets. And Jesus gave them a similar calling to follow him, and they left everything, including their father, in the boats in order to follow Jesus Christ. Now, following Jesus Christ is synonymous with living for Christ, being a disciple. We became disciples on the day that we were baptized. On the day that we were baptized, we were born again of water and spirit. But simply because we were born again of water and spirit, simply because through baptism we shared in the death of Jesus and also shared in his resurrection, does not necessarily mean that we are followers of Christ. Sadly, there are so many Orthodox Christians and perhaps some of us who simply believe that because we are Orthodox Christians, we make the sign of the cross, we come to church at Easter and Christmas and perhaps on other occasions during the year, that we are thereafter Christians, but this is not necessarily the case. According to today's Gospel lesson, Following Jesus, being a disciple, being a Christian, is not a prerogative. It is an option. This means it constitutes a choice. We have a choice. We have the choice to either follow Christ, as did the disciples in today's gospel lesson, or not to follow him, or not to follow him. And of course, to exercise the latter choice, is to run the risk of experience darkness in this life, emptiness as so many of us experience. 
a darkness not dissimilar to that darkness experienced by Adam and Eve, that darkness of sin, suffering, sickness, death, worry, despondency, greed, gluttony, lust, and this because of their disobedience, and this because of their disobedience. Now, regrettably, the reality is that in this life, many of us make the latter choice. We choose not to follow Christ. And the reason for this, in my opinion, is a relatively easy one. It has to do with the fact that it is more difficult to follow Jesus than it is not to follow him. It is more difficult to be what God wants us to be and to do what God wants us to do than not to be what God wants us to be and to do what God wants us to do, keeping in mind, as Father Hopko tells us, being what God wants to be and doing what God wants to do is the whole purpose in life. And truly, it is more difficult to be rich toward God than it is to be rich toward ourselves, as was that rich, wealthy farmer mentioned in Jesus' parables, whereby we choose to eat we drink to be merry, to pursue pleasure, to put other things before God, and to put other things before our concern for other people. But yet interestingly, yet interestingly, what Jesus Christ clearly teaches us, it is by following the difficult way that we can experience what? We can experience joy and happiness in this life and the fruit of the Holy Spirit, including love and kindness and gentleness. Jesus himself says as much. We read in the Sermon on the Mount where he says, enter in by the narrow way. Enter in by the narrow way because wide is the way and broad is the path that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, but narrow is the way and difficult is the path that leads to life and few go in it. Now, in my own personal life, I have chosen and I continue to choose many times unsuccessfully to follow the difficult way. Why? Because I get tired of the darkness of this world. I enjoy seeing light. I enjoy knowing where exactly it is that I am going. I like experiencing that joy spoken of in that famous Protestant hymn, God forbid that a priest should quote a famous Protestant hymn, written by John Newton in 1847, Amazing Grace, how great thou art to save a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found, I am blind, but now I see. Keeping in mind that for us Orthodox Christians, the amazing grace comes to us through our faith in Jesus Christ, through our decision to follow Christ, and through our willingness to avail ourselves of the grace of God through the sacraments of the church, through the sacraments of the church. Now, obedience unto Christ comes with it with a number of promises, and these promises reassure us. They reassure us that as the beautiful festal hymn that is sung on many of the major feast days of the Vespers, they reassure us that we have no God who is so great a God who alone does wonders and works miracles. Now, what are the promises? The very promises that no doubt inspired the apostles to follow Christ and practically all of them except for St. John the Divine to willingly die for Christ a martyr's death. And today, allow me to share three promises. The first promise has to do with eternal life. Death is a reality. Let's be honest. There isn't a person here who wants to die. There isn't a person here who doesn't fear death. And yet we have this promise if we simply are willing to asseverate it and to assert it and to believe it that if we believe in Christ, if we believe in Christ, we shall attain eternal life. Why? Because God loves us. He loves you. I don't want to hear anything about I am not loved in this world. I am not affirmed because we have a God who loves us. And if we believe in him, 
we shall have eternal life. Not just believing in him as many say, I believe in Jesus, I believe in God, but believe in him in the manner that we believe in him as we articulate our faith in him through the Nicene Creed that we recite at every divine liturgy. This beautiful creed that was given to us by the 318 fathers at the Council of Nicaea in order to refute the heresies that were dividing the church at the time. And we keep in mind, we keep in mind, do you want to live forever? Do you want to conquer life's last great enemy, as Father Shemim calls it? Then not only do you have to believe, but you have to profess that belief. For as the Holy Apostle Paul tells us, as the Holy Apostle Paul tells us, in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, the second promise has to do with help. Help is something that each and every one of us want. I'm not talking about the help that we can accord ourselves. I am not talking about the comfort and the love and the help we get from our spouses or from our children and from our friends. This type of help and this type of comfort and this type of love is important. But I am talking about that type of help that helps us overcome our existential angst in this life. Are you ill at the present time? Are you looking at a foreboding disease that may affect your life and take your life away from you? Do you have an addiction in your life? Are you unhappily married? And are you struggling to maintain your marriage? Are you experiencing grief because a sense of loss? Then come on, let's do what we need to do. Let's go to Christ. What does he say? Come to me, you who are heavy laden. You who are heavy laden. And who of us isn't heavy laden at one time or another? And I will give you rest for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And how do we come to Jesus? How do we come to Christ? We come to him through the word. We come to him through the sacraments. We come to him through the church. And we come to him by being obedient unto the commandments of God, including the commandment of love. And then the final promise has to do with light, the darkness. Believe me, the world in which we live is a beautiful place, but there is so much darkness. Crime, war in the Ukraine and other parts of the world, immorality, partisan politics that have us hating one another in this country of ours which was founded upon democratic principles and which now has us questioning the strength and the ability of our government to govern us in the fashion in which we are used to being governed. Darkness, and yet there is light. There is light at the end of the tunnel. Every time you come into the church and you light a candle, what are you doing? You're making a profession of faith symbolically, metaphorically, that you believe in the light who is Christ who says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, Jesus, we are told after Peter and Andrew and James and John agreed to follow Christ, went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, as I am now teaching you in the church, preaching the gospel, and also healing all kinds of sicknesses and infirmities. And what Jesus did, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is what we ourselves must do. Jesus wants us to go out, Christ wants us to go out and make followers of all people by doing the very same thing that he did and that the apostles did. I remind you, of course, of the words of the Evangelistic Commission because it is a commission that rests not only with Father Gregory and Father Michael or myself, but it rests with each and every one of us and that is to go out and make disciples of all people. And we have to begin with ourselves. We have to begin with ourselves. Make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you to do. And the way we can do this is by being obedient unto Christ and following Christ, nurturing our faith, existentializing it, and abiding by the commandments of God but thus it is, as St. Siloan tells us, that we can become one with God and have that reassurance that God will abide with us and in fact abide with us forever. Amen.